Gospel of Mark. Mark will see Jesus Christ as a servant, as Matthew saw Jesus Christ as the Jewish king. There's no genealogy in Mark because a servant has no genealogy. Matthew has a genealogy of a king going back to King David. You're going to see Jesus Christ as a servant. And what you're going to see in this gospel is you're going to see deeds rather than words. Mark is a shorter gospel because as far as words, they're not recorded. The actions that Jesus done, the doing, those are recorded. Um, Mark is the Mark called John in Acts. This is the same John Mark that left Paul's exposition, left early. Paul got angry with him and Barnabas took him later. And then later Paul writes to us in 2 Timothy, Mark was of value. He was of credit to the ministry. Mark had to be with Jesus to see the life of Jesus to write what's recorded. He is a disciple, apostle. He's just one that wasn't really mentioned. But here he is, giving a whole book about the Lord Jesus Christ. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The good news. That's the good news. Something good. What's the good news? Jesus Christ. Because that's what gospel means. Gospel means good news. As it is written in the prophets. So Mark starts off Jesus Christ number one. And then as is written in the prophets number two. That's how John starts off his gospel. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And I can't quote that completely. Ma Matthew goes right into here's the genealogy of the king. Mark starts in here's Jesus Christ. And he is written as the prophets. And this is the deeds thereof. Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And with Matthew, that's John the Baptist. So we pick up Isaiah chapter 40. And the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness. And preached the baptism of repentance. For the remissions of sin. Where's the fire? Mark's not writing about the damnation. The judgment of wrath of God. He's right. Hey, John came to preach. You know what you were supposed to do when John came? He taught you're supposed to remission. You're supposed to repent. Repent and remission are the words of John. That is what Jesus has come to do. The servant of God take away the sin of the world. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea. And they of Jerusalem. And were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So John had an active ministry. They're coming out of the capital city, the holy city, Jerusalem. They're coming out from all of Judea. And this is when Israel is in their land. They're heading out to the Jordan River. Where... Joshua came into the land. This will be the same spot that Jesus will come in the second advent along the king's highway. John is preparing the people. John has been repeat, re repenting. I mean, John has been preaching repentance and remission. And he will be whole to the nation, the Lord Jesus Christ. So when Jesus stops up in the ministry, John has already set the stage for people to know who Jesus is. 
You know what a preacher is supposed to do in his church before the congregation? Prepare the people so when Jesus calls, we'll be prepared. When we hear, come up hither, we'll be found not lacking, but we're supposed to be earning crowns and rewards and fruits, aren't we not? This nation, when Jesus shows up on the spot, is supposed to be ready for him. Supposed to be repentant. Supposed to be getting right. Everybody. And they're not. And John was clothed with camel's hair. And with a girdle of skin about his loins. And he did eat locusts and wild honey. And it's funny how that's recorded. In Matthew and Mark. And yet that's the character of Elijah. And preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. Notice Matthew told us that John the Baptist rebuked them, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. That's missing in Mark. Here comes Jesus Christ. We're not lifting up the preacher. Preacher said, hey, listen, I'm just a voice. The one that's coming, I'm not worthy of anything of him. The preacher that lifts himself up is not a Bible preacher. He lifts up Jesus Christ in honor of Jesus Christ. I wonder, no, shut up. I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose his, his shoes, he says. That would be bowing down, worshiping. Lord, let me take your shoes off. And yet we're talking about a gospel about Jesus Christ as a servant. And do you remember what happened in John chapter 12? Jesus sat those disciples down, took off their shoes and started washing their feet. And gave him the greatest illustration of what a servant is to be. There's a problem Matthew had. Well, Lord, who's going to be the greatest in your kingdom? I'll tell you who's the greatest. The one who will wash your feet, your stinking, lousy feet. That's the greatest. The one that will take the brutal pain and suffering and go to that cross. That's. Remember, Jesus, he done it willingly. He done, he done it lovingly. But. In the garden in Matthew, we read, that is the will of the Father. And what Jesus Christ is doing in the flesh, 100% God, 100% man, he's doing what the Father is telling him to do all the way. And John says, I'm not even, John is saying, I'm humble. And the custom of the time, you know why he says, I'm not worthy of Luke? Because it is foot washing. When someone came in your house, uh, Abraham Servant, when they came in the house, they washed their feet and gave their asses for thunder and the camels. On. That was, listen, you, you had sandals, your feet got dirt. John's saying, I'm not even worried to undo those holy shoes to wash them feet. I'm not worthy. He made that dirt. He made them feet. He made them things that to make those sandals. I must increase, he must decrease. That's what the Bible says, John says. I must decrease, he must, in, I'm not calling that word. But John is saying, listen, it's all about Jesus. I'm going to tell you, when you got ministers out there and preachers out there where their name is the name of the ministry, I indeed have baptized you with water. There it is, the Jordan River. But he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Oh, there's a difference between water baptism and the Holy Ghost baptism. Get that. Get that with what we read in Matthew and the Pentecostals. It looks like when John baptized them with water, they did not get the Holy Ghost. Because he's going to come and give you the Holy Ghost. 
And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee up north, where he lived, the city, not a Nazarene, a Nazareth. <clears throat> And was baptized of John in Jordan. Now remember, we had a little in Matthew. Well, I'm not worried. You're supposed to see that's gone. That's this is the deeds of Jesus. We're not getting to all the words that John said. We're not getting to all the words that Jesus. We're going to point out his deeds as a servant. What do you do with a servant? If you're having a conversation. Man, my servant, he brings my meal. He don't tell what, what he says to you at the meal. He brings my coffee. He cleans my car. He washes the floor. You point out the deeds, not the words of the servant. And a servant usually does not have a lot of words. Yes, sir. T, sir. The blue suit, sir. So Mark is showing Jesus Christ as a true servant. And that today is it's defiled. It's, uh, I don't want to be referenced as a servant. When you go to work, you're a servant. Your boss tells you what to do. Your parents are supposed to tell you what to do. Your teacher. See, we're getting away from that stuff. A teacher is supposed to tell you what to do. Be baptized of John in the Jordan. And straightway. Now, you know that's not for sin because Jesus is sinless. That's not for the Holy Ghost, verse 8, because Jesus already has the Holy Ghost. He's being an example to the people. And straightway, now that word is going to show up a lot in Mark. And it says here, straightway is a servant's word. I I don't understand that. I'm, but they're saying that's a servant word. That's what it's supposed to do immediately. Immediate, yeah, but I'm just saying, that's, I don't understand. Straightway. There's no question, it, what, what Trey said, it's immediate. There's no, well, I don't want to do it. Not now. I'm busy. Straightway coming up out of the water. Immersion. You don't come up out of water if you're sprinkled, dinkled, or water gunned. He saw the heavens open. Now this is quoted in Matthew. But it says he saw. John saw the heavens open. That would be a wonderful thing. What do you see when you see the heavens open? Are you looking at the throne of God? The cherubim? The angels? I, I've seen the heaven open. I've seen blue sky. I've never seen the heaven open with God behind it. Is that going to happen at the rapture? And the Spirit, capital S, like a dove, like a dove, descending upon him. He saw, John saw the heavens open, and the Spirit, like a dove, descending upon him. That would be Jesus. And there came a voice from heaven, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Never says I'm proud of you, Son. Who I am well pleased. That's God's way of saying, well done, thou good and faithful Son. That's God's statement for what men say, I'm proud of you, my boy. There's no pride with God. And immediately the Spirit driven him into the wilderness. And left John just standing there in the water. Ever wonder anybody else? Is, where did he go? He was just there a minute ago. And immediately the Spirit driven him into the wilderness. Isn't that a remarkable word? Matthew said led. Luke says led. But where do you find driven or dry what did God do to Adam and Eve drove them out of the garden the Holy Spirit driven Jesus out of that water into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted of Satan and was with the wild beast the animals with him and the angels ministered unto him what happened to that great talk if thou be the son of God, see that's not in there. He went to the wilderness, Satan tempted him, there were wild animals, and the angels came and took care of him. Now, after John was put in prison, what? 
Mark really closed the chapter on John, didn't he? He leaves John, Jesus gone, now he's in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Kingdom of heaven was in Matthew. Kingdom of God, that's the spiritual kingdom. That's God himself. That's the angels. That's the cherubim. Kingdom of heaven is when you got birds. A literal physical throne. A literal physical city. And people. And saying, the time is fulfilled. This is now the day. This is the time. And I was talking to a friend at church last night. morning. After Adam and Eve sinned against God, why did God wait so long to have Jesus come? And he, he said, you know, he let man have his chance with the with the Babel. He let man have his chance with the flood and let man have a chance for, you know, and all that. But just got to wonder, why didn't Jesus come a lot sooner? I'll tell you why. The time is at, the time is fulfilled because this is the time God has appointed. And there's no reason for me to question why. Though sometimes I wonder. And the kingdom of God is at hand. It's not there yet. Why? Because Jesus has come in the flesh, God and human, 100% both. But he already knows they're going to give him a cross. They're going to reject him. He knows that already. If they would not have rejected him, if they would have received him, he was at the kingdom of heaven right here, right now, friends. But I know what you're going. Jesus knew from the beginning what's going to happen to him, and he still went. How's that? It's almost like Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel didn't know what was going to happen. He might have thought he was going to be kitty cat food. But you were to throw Jesus in that in that lion, then Jesus had could be no problem. Come here, kitties. <laughs> I know I'm coming out of this. Jesus already knew. And he knew they were going to reject him. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, well, he's taking quite a bit of trip. He goes down to the Jordan. Somewhere down by Jericho, south of Jericho, where Joshua was from. He goes somewhere in the wilderness, which I have no idea where that wilderness is. I'm not even going to pitch. Then he goes back up to Galilee. So he's walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he sees Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. And they were fishers, actively working. They're tossing their net in the sea. Now, you're going to find different accounts of Peter and Andrew. And some say that he met them twice. And according to John, it looks like he may have. Because at one point, Andrew goes and gets Peter and brings him to Jesus. But we know one thing by Peter's apostleship and James and John's apostleship. They were baptized of John the Baptist to be apostles. And we'll get on to that as we go into Luke and John. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you, I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed. They left. There we go. Let's go. No questioning. They knew who Jesus was. John tells us about Andrew. Let's go. And when he had gone a little further, farther, thence he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. These are fixing their nets. Peter and Andrew are fishing. James and John are not fishing. They are fixing so they can fish. Straightway he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. 
Now, Zebedee never gets up and goes. You know what's funny? Later on, you read his wife did. And it looks like his wife follows Jesus all along. And you know what it's like James and John? Because you never read about this guy again. Dad, you don't want to follow Jesus? Goodbye. Take the servants. See ya. And they went into Capernaum. You can find it on the map. Straightway on the Sabbath day, uh-oh, he entered into the synagogue, the synagogue, and taught. The synagogue, where Jews gathered together to hear the word. Nothing wrong. And they were astonished at his doctrine, teaching. That's what doctrine means, what he was taught. For he taught, see, the, the Bible gives you a definition of the words. He taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Ouch. Now that's not really putting the scribes down, but here is God speaking his own words that no man can speak. And he picks up the scriptures, the scroll, and Isaiah, and he picks up and starts reading and then stops at a particular place and says, all right, this is now fulfilled in your eyes and they're up there blinking like what is it that the scribes haven't done that Jesus has done ladies and gentlemen brethren fellow Jews prophecy is now begun to happen in your eyes it began with John the Baptist now the scroll that I just read to you here I am and they're like, wow, no scribe, no priest could say in the Bible, okay, open up the eyes. Okay, that's me. They couldn't do that. Jesus could. And one of any messages that Jesus ever preached, John says, if he would write it all, there's no world can complete. You want to jump if Jesus ever preached out of Isaiah uh, 40, but John the Baptist is this character right here, boys. That's another prophecy because it's quoted in Mark 1 and it's quoted in Matthew. I forget which chapter number. So they're, they're sitting there and they're like, wow. And there was in their synagogue, the synagogue, now their synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out. So the first thing that Mark tells us is an anti-Holy Spirit that opposes Jesus Christ. And guess where this guy is? He's in synagogue. It says they were, there was in their synagogue. He's in the assembly of the people. Not much going on in that synagogue, was it? This is the moral and spiritual condition of Israel. In their church, there's a devil. <laughs> he didn't have to go far, did he? He's got four disciples already. He goes into a meeting with his disciples already. Now, first guy shows up. Devil. He just dealt with the devil in the wilderness. Here's the devil back again. Saying, let me alone. Absolutely not. Let us alone. Us means more than one. Let us alone. Rebellion, withdrawal. Get out of here, Jesus. And James says they, they tremble in fear. You know what they're thinking? You follow in Matthew. I can quote Matthew. We've already studied. They think Jesus has come to destroy them now. They think this is the second advent. If not, this is the great white throne judgment. Didn't one devil tell him somewhere in Matthew, have you come to torment us before our time? They know there's a time coming. Let us alone. What have we to do with thee? Thou Jesus of Nazareth. Wow, they know where he lives. 
John 1 46 the devils are very clean keen to know they told a bunch of Jewish people Jesus we know Paul we know but who are you you know what that implies if you live godly in Christ Jesus the devils in hell know who you are not only is your name known in heaven is your name known in hell how's that for a remarkable statement when you get up in the morning what what do the devils do do they hit the snooze alarm or do they get scared that you're going to go do something for Jesus You know what they would have to fear of you if you do right? You may depopulate hell by one soul that day. Thou Jesus of Nazareth, art thou come to destroy us? So they know Jesus is going to destroy them one day. For, uh, eternal fire which is made for Satan and his angels. I know thee who thou art the Holy One of God. Look at their acknowledgement. And you can't even get men on the street to acknowledge that. You can't even get Christians to acknowledge that, but a devil of hell can. How would you like to have somebody at the great white throne judgment have God call a devil up and say, Who is that guy? That's Jesus, the Son of God. Can you tell that atheist that, please? Wouldn't that be a kick in the butt? And Jesus rebuked him. Him. I thought it was us. He says, I know. There is a plenty of us, but there's one main unclean devil that does the speaking. And Jesus did, says, rebuked him. Saying, hold thy peace. And come out of him. No holy water. No crucifix. No cash to check or money order. No wearing your, your shirt on backwards. No hocus pocus, fee fi fo, in boom, this and the And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, that's one of the signs of, of Satanism. Not all the time, because Jesus cried out in a loud voice. You gotta be careful. But that is a sign of devil possession. It's a loud voice, but there are other loud voices in the Bible. You know, sickness, there's devil. Yeah, other people get sick too in the Bible, and it wasn't devil possession. See, there's a thin line. He came out of him. And they were all amazed insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? What's this teaching? He didn't teach nothing but one thing. The devils are subject to him. Would that not be proof enough you're dealing with God? Is it Israel? Isn't that enough? For with authority commandeth he the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. Men should also obey the authority of God, and they don't. Do you realize man, even saved man, will not do what God tells him to do, and an unclean spirit does what God tells him to do. That's a shame. When death, when Satan's men, or whatever you want to call them, spirits, whatever, are more to listen to God than a saved man. Right there. And it amazed the people that those devils listen to Jesus. And yet you got churches that do not listen to God and there's no amazement. Unless you are doing what the Bible... You know, you ever, you ever stand in a Christian look... 
What are you doing? Don't tell people you're a Christian, please. Shut up. Keep it to yourself. You know what you're standing? You're standing there amazed on the doctor and what that idiot, his life is not proving. And then when you do right, you got un you got Christians, worldly Christians, who look at you like, what is wrong with you? I wouldn't do that. And yet that's the Bible. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around about Galilee. There you go. The fame of Jesus is what? He has power over the devils. That's the first thing that Mark records. Jesus Christ has power over the devil. And Mark starts off the beginning of the gospel, the good news, you've got the one that has the power over the devil. How? It is written. That's a great start for the gospel of Mark. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, this is all going on in the synagogue. They entered in the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. So this place had to be by Simon and Andrew's house. This would probably be, I would assume, Simon and Andrew's synagogue. I assume. Simon and Andrew brought a, brought a guest to church that day. And their guests made an uproar in the services. And you would say that Simon and Andrew did not bring an unsaved person to the synagogue. They brought a, the one that saves to the synagogue. But Simon's wife, mother, ooh, ooh, the Pope's mother-in-law, but Simon's wife, mother, lay sick of a fever like Matthew, and anon, that means quickly, they tell him of her. So she's in a bedroom somewhere, laying somewhere. She's sick. And hey, Jesus has come in the house. And he came and took her by the hand. He steps into the, whatever the part, wherever she is. They tell her, whatever her name is. Jesus is coming. Jesus comes into her took her by the hand and lifted her up and immediately follow the word anon immediately look at that again the bible just told you what the words meant the fever left her and she ministered unto them complete healing and then she gets up and serves jesus he just served her so mark opens up here is Jesus Christ. Before all the people of this synagogue, he has power over the devils. Before his four disciples, the first four, the fishermen, come in, I'll be making fishermen. He shows them what I would assume a private healing that look, I can heal. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew are standing in that room or sitting. They are in the house, and they just watched the mother-in-law get healed. And you can look at the condition. She was unable to get out of bed. He walks over, touches her, she gets up, and now she's giving them soup and biscuits. And Before Peter and James and John's eyes and Andrew. And you assume that the wife, at least you think Peter's wife witnessed and but maybe a few others. It's not private. Jesus doesn't do anything private. At least the mother-in-law was there to see it. Jesus has no secret society. It's common knowledge what he does. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if he pulled her. And immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto him. And at even, 6 p.m., 
Now, verse 21, it said they went and confirmed straightway on the Sabbath day. Going 6 p.m. on the Sabbath. And he hasn't been yelled at, has he? You know what's that? He healed a man of devils on the Sabbath in the synagogue. Everybody acknowledged it. The word gets out and no one got upset, according to Mark. And that even when the sun did set, tells you what time the Bible is, which is 6 p.m. Jewish time, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils. The word got out, they started carrying them. I wonder if they had ambulances and all that back then. But here they come. In the Bible, here comes your first ambulatory patients to Jesus. They don't bring him to a hospital, they bring him to Jesus. And all the city was gathered together at the door. Now, you know Simon's wife with it, now she's really upset. They're going to track mud in the house. They're going to just make a mess. They can't even get out. They block the door. They come to see Jesus. They got all kinds of diseases. They got all kinds of devils. Oh, this is really great. You know the neighborhood would really love this. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases. Different and unknown kind of diseases. And cast out many devils. And suffered not the devils to speak. He let, he let him speak over here in verse number 24. He did not allow them to speak here. Because they knew him. The devils knew Jesus. And in the morning. Rising up a great while before day. So he got some sleep. It's Sunday morning, the first day of the week. He went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. He got alone. And Simon and they that were with him, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, followed after him. Hey, where'd he go? Let's go get him. When they have found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. They're, they're still coming knocking on the door. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore shall therefore came I forth. This is his mission, his outreach. He's going to the people. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. So he's on a circuit. He's a visiting evangelist. There came a leper to him. Unclean devil, fever, all kinds of diseases. Now we got leprosy. Israel is sick. Then came a leper to him. Numbers 5 two to three beseeching him you weren't supposed to do that as a leper unclean unclean get away from me got a contagious disease here law says get away from me he comes unto him beseeching him, kneeling down to him saying unto him if thou wilt thou canst make me clean now he's saying listen you can do it Jesus but you don't have to. But I know you can do it. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him. And saith unto him, I will be thou clean. Just by his words. You know how wonderful those words of Jesus were? In, in the beginning was the word, John 1, 1. Let there be light. Let there be a sun. Let there be... Be clean. And he was clean. And as soon as the only thing I do is say, Come up hither. Boom. And also as soon as he spoke in immediately the immediately the, how quick is the lap rapture gonna be? Immediately. As soon as he says 
Now come up. I don't think he's going to finish the sentence. The leprosy departed. Where did it go? Isn't that a funny word? Departed. From him, and he was cleansed. The bacteria was gone. Leprosy is a bacteria. And he straightway charged him and forthwith sent him away. There's that straightway again. And saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man. And he tells people that, but they don't do it. Is it the fact that th these people knew this guy, knew he was a leper? They're going to ask him. That guy that was blind. Didn't they ask him all kinds of questions in John? But go thy way. Show thyself to the priest. And offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Don't tell anybody. Go right to the priest. Go right to the temple. You know that's going to shock them? Guy comes up to the to the, the front veil. What are you here for? I had leprosy. What do I bring? Oh, oh man, where's that? I, I think that's in. Oh, uh, wait a minute. You had leprosy and you're clean. Yeah, that's never happened, except for Naaman. That's not. That's never happened in Israel. And he makes this guy go tell the priest. Now it says, show thyself to the priest for a testimony unto them. You see that them? Match that to the priest. This guy is going to go tell those priests, guess what? Here's the Messiah. Now let me, you, know, you don't believe that? What was one of the signs Moses was told to bring to the children of Israel? Put your hand in your, in your cloak and pull it out. What was it? It was leprosy. Put it back in. Now pull it out. What was it? White as snow. After the law, only Naaman ever got cleansed and left. This has not happened in Israel. The priests don't even know how to handle this. Those pages in Leviticus are dusty, probably stuck together like my Bible. Don't use sticky notes for your Bible or sticky tabs. That's extra. But he went out and began to publish it much as a witness. And to blaze abroad that, that's a great word to use. Think about big wildfire. You couldn't shut this thing up. I mean, I have sat under some preachers, guest preachers, have come into church and they set that thing on fire as a blade. And then that idiot preacher gets up there, I call it fire water. He's got a remark on what the preacher that said about the message. You know, he's a wonderful, and you just fire water. This guy, this visiting preacher has come in with a blaze for all the people's heart and you just come in and put the fire out. That's how I see that word. He sets Israel on fire. That's what the expression is. Abroad the matter, in so much that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city. But was without in desert places. You want a revival? They came to him from every quarter. He didn't go to them. They came to him. How's that for a revival? You know, Nehemiah? They prepared Nehemiah. They had the, the they wanted the book. They prepared the, the pulpit and everything for Nehemiah. So, yeah, Ezra was written in Nehemiah. When was the last time Christians went out seeking for God? Outside the church, outside the tabernacle, outside the synagogue. He's in a desert place. You know that picture right there with the old fashioned times would have been? The old camp meeting, the old tent preaching. There's no building. 
So we open up with the Gospel of Mark. There is much happening. There is much sickness in, the, in the Israel. And Jesus begins 